Before you, you have the combined concert choir of Gwen Park High School from Brandywine, Maryland. On behalf of our principal, Mrs. Tracy Miller, our amazing administration team, and the entire Yellow Jacket family, we were delighted to accept your invitation to perform for you tonight. I think it's important that our students see the faces of those individuals that govern their education. And I think it's equally important that you are able to see their talents and skills displayed here tonight. Tonight we'll be performing three songs for you. The first song will be Wake Up Everybody, made popular by John Legend. Our solos will be Jonas Colbert, Angel Harden, and Shakia Risby. Our second piece will be Seasons of Love, uh, made popular by the Broadway musical Rent. Our soloists will be Alexis Fultz and Devin Davis. And our final piece will be Yes You Can, arranged by Donnie McClurkin, and will feature our very own science teacher at Gwynn Park, Mrs. Leslie Maddox. Uh, I hope you enjoy our presentation tonight. Thank you. Wake up everybody, no more sleeping in bed. No more backward thinking, a time for thinking ahead. The world has changed so very much from what it used to be. There was so much hatred, war and poverty. Wake up all the teachers, time to teach a new way. Maybe then I'll listen what you have to say cause they're the ones who's coming up and the world is in their hands when you teach the children teach them the very best you can the world won't get no better if you just let it be the world won't get no builders time to build a new land I know we can do it if we all lend a hand you the soul that's put in our mind so that things will work out they do every time
25,600 minutes 525,000 more to plan 525,600 minutes How do you measure the life of a woman or a man? In truth that she learned Or in times that he cried In bridges he burned Or the way that she died
Georgia's County Public Schools because my teachers and counselors have prepared me for academic success. This year, I am taking AP Physics B, AP Literature, AP Calculus AB, and Aerospace Science 6. My plans for the future is to attend it. United States Air Force Academy or Embry-Riddle Aeronautical Engineering, Aeronautical University to major in Aeronautical Engineering. My long-term goal is to serve as a pilot for the United States Air Force. So far, I have a scholarship with Tuskegee Youth and Aviation Program for a private pilot's license and a $32,000 scholarship to Arizona State University. Now I want to welcome you to the January 26, 2012 Prince George's County Board of Education meeting. Some highlights this evening will include a discussion about Transportation Task Force, a proclamation on commemorating National Counseling Week, February 6th through 10th, and commemorating National African American History Month in Prince George's County Public School System. Please keep checking www.pgcps.org for upcoming Board of Education meeting and events. And now, the January 26th Board of Education meeting will begin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Billy Martin Batista. Good evening. Welcome to the January 26, 2012 meeting of the Prince George's County Board of Education. Before we begin, please turn off your wireless communications as they tend to interfere with taping of the meeting. Our colleague, Mrs. Hathaway Beck, will not be in attendance tonight. I want to thank um, Gwen Park High School Choir for the selections. And again, I also, <laughs> we assume they were, um, Mr. Coleman, they were aired for our public to see. Thank you very much. We thank you for that. And also, I want to thank again uh, Mr. Mar Mr. Uh, Bautista of Oxen Hill for his introduction at the board meeting. We are so impressed with um, his goals and what he intends to do uh, going forward. And you look quite sharp in your uniform. Ms. Boston, please lead us in the board prayer and pledge of allegiance. Thank you, Mrs. Boston. Ms. Dent, call the roll, please. Mr. Armwood. Present. Mrs. Beck. Ms. Boston. Present. Mr. Burroughs. Present. Ms. Eubanks. Present. Ms. Johnson. Present. Ms. Waller. Present. Ms. Jackson. Present. Ms. Higgins. Present. Mrs. Jacobs. Present. Thank you. Colleagues, may I please have a motion to adopt the January 26, 2012 board meeting agenda? So, so moved. Thank you, Mr. Second. Burroughs. Thank you, Mr. Burroughs. It's been properly moved and second that we adopt the agenda as presented tonight. All in favor? Aye. Any objections or abstentions? Seeing none, motion passed. Colleagues, may I have a motion to approve the January 5, 2012 board meeting minutes? Thank you, Ms. Boston. Ms. Waller, it's been properly moved and second that we approve the minutes for the January 5, 2012 board meeting. All in favor? Any objections or abstentions? Seeing none, the ayes have it. We will now have a news break entitled Learning About Computers from the Inside.
The applause for Jessica Cedillos was not unexpected since she and her classmates enrolled in a brand new information technology program routinely take apart damaged computers, put them back together, and have them work as good as new. Fairmont Heights High School's IT course, with 70 students spread over three ninth grade classes, has been designed with just one goal in mind, that all the students will ultimately qualify as IT professionals. This year, uh, we have ninth grade students, and our focus on the ninth grade is basically computer repair and operating systems. So we're working through this year, we're developing skills so children can build, repair, troubleshoot, take a look at a computer and determine what's wrong with it. And at the end of this course, or through the course, our hope is that each one of these children will become certified. So whether it's a processor, a soundboard, a CPU, or an optical drive, the Fairmont IT students soon learn to identify and use them all in the classroom and just on the other side of the wall in the school system's technology distribution center. Having access to such a unique in-house work-study program with adult mentors has been great for the children and the grown-ups too. The students are actually doing the warranty work on items, items that I've actually been doing and it took me years and years to learn and to get to this point in my life and they are learning it right here, right now and in high school. I'm impressed, they seem to really know their way around. These kids that are doing the work, these are some of the kids that even volunteer themselves to come after school and do some of this work. So these are some good students and they've already got many, many hours doing this so far. So I, I, I was impressed myself the first time seeing them do this and they also do really love it, so yeah. it's good. You can tell. We have two things going on here. So on the other side of the wall, we have operations going on. And there's been a lot of work over there, but the classroom has been great. The children have been wonderful. We're very excited about it. And, and, and the children are excited about working in with, with IT, comparing uh, computers, and working with us. So it's been a lot of fun in that sense. There may be a lot of fun, but there is also plenty of intensity and a high level of professionalism as the students repair damaged motherboards and replace broken LCD panels with the skills of a surgeon. What's wrong with this computer? Uh, well, it was damaged and you could see purple. Oh, yeah. Yes. I guess they spilled something on it. Mm -hmm. Yes, and it was cracked a little. Yeah. What is it about this that you really enjoy? Um, I really like just when I don't know how to do something, looking around to see what I did wrong and what I missed, and like when I find the problem that I have, when I fix it, it feels much better than just knowing how to do everything and just blowing through it. Learning is better than knowing everything. Why did you enroll in this class? Well, I really lo like technology. like. I just want to be like the next Bill Gates or the next Steve Jobs, you know. Cyrus and his classmates could very well be the next IT superstars and get paid very well along the way since their subsequent coursework is designed for increasingly sophisticated certification. A computer repairman can demand, you know, forty to fifty thousand right off the bat. So once they're certified and they have that experience, they can go out and get a, a good job. Um, but we're looking at expanding that. So in the tenth grade, and the eleventh grade, and twelfth grade, we're looking at for the for the engineering piece of it, if you will, we're looking at uh, continued certification. So we're looking at Microsoft certification to become a Microsoft Systems Engineer, and we're looking at Cisco certification to become a CCNA. And these opportunities provide uh, up in the in the range of 75,000 once they get that experience and they get those certifications. But for now, as students work hard and dream big, the challenge is to learn as much as they can and not sweat the small stuff, which when it comes to computers can be very small indeed. The main thing I had to work at is getting all these screws out. That's the most, that's the horrible part about it, all these screws. and. Actually, I haven't had one time where I've had all the screws put back in because they're so hard to keep track of. <laughs> Loose screws notwithstanding, the IT students at Fairmont and their dedicated teachers deserve hearty congratulations for a job well done. 
For channels 96 and 38, this is Dave Zarin reporting. The learning about computers from the inside, I just wanted to take the opportunity to say thank you to Mr. Watts because this has been a, um, a project in his mind for some time now and so we want to really commend you for your forethought to not only have this program but to put it in a, in a school where kids who could really benefit from, from this opportunity. So we really appreciate your, your leadership around that. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, of course, often um, Ms. Dr. Coleman Potter Anytime I have a computer problem, she swears that it's user error. So maybe the students can help me out a little bit in terms of what I usually have going on. Um, a great announcement. Whitehall Elementary School in Bowie was named a blue ribbon school by the Maryland State Department of Education. And it is one of only six schools in the state and the only school in Prince George's County. So you know, you know, I'm going to go through all the numbers and everything, but you know, I think we always need to remind ourselves and remind our citizens that you know we have schools that are doing great things, and we have children who are doing great things across this district. Whitehall Elementary School is a 450 student kindergarten through fifth grade. Um, it will compete this fall for a National Blue Ribbon Award from the U.S. Department of Education. Whitehall Elementary opened seven years ago with a vision of educating children beyond expectations through dedicated teaching and committed parents. On the 2011 Maryland School Assessment, 97.9% .9 of students achieved proficiency or advanced in both reading and math with nearly half, 42.6% in reading and 49% in math. The faculty includes eight national board certified teachers. From 2006 to 2010, the school's proficiency rates in reading and math rose almost 10 percentage points as measured by federal accountability guidelines, which we know as the adequate yearly progress. Reading proficiency rates increased from 86.7 to 96.3. Math proficiency rates increased from 89.6 to 98.6. Each Maryland Blue Ribbon School will receive a flag, $2,000 prize, interactive smart board, and school-wide pizza party. Let us know when the pizza party is, Dr. Hyde. The Blue Ribbon School program is a state and national program that recognizes and honors schools that exhibit high performance and or significant improvement in reading and mathematic achievement as measured by Maryland's assessments. The schools must meet rigorous standards developed by the State Department of Education and the U.S. Department of Education. These schools are either extremely high achievers in reading and math or economically disadvantaged schools exceeding norms and dramatically improving in student achievement in reading and math. Other achievements, achievement indicators include school leadership, professional development, and instructional approaches based on its school age population. I want to thank Principal Campbell. I know he's really excited and his staff for the wonderful work. And we know we have some very engaged parents as well at Whitehall Elementary School who to this day still call me um, about what they're doing over there. So we, we appreciate that and congratulate them again. Baden Elementary School will receive a $6,000 grant for con continued technology innovation from the Upper Marlboro Rotary Club, allowing the school to purchase iPads and electronic literature software to assist struggling readers in grades three through six. Seven students from Prince George's County Public Schools are recipients of four-year full tuition college scholarships from the Posse Foundation. We usually do this announcement every year. The Posse Foundation is a college access and youth leadership program that identifies, recruits, and trains students in urban high schools and sends them in multicultural teams called Posses to colleges and universities. Nearly 1,600 high school seniors were nominated national, nationwide, and each student will receive a scholarship worth up to $140,000 from one of the foundation's partner schools. The recipients from Prince George's County, Darren Duffin of Blainsburg High School, is going to Pepperdine University. Janina Fripp of Eleanor Roosevelt High School, Suwanee, the University of the South. Alea Minor, Oxen Hill High School, will be going to Lafayette College. Tulio Quevedo of Crossland High School will be going to the University of Wisconsin Madison. He can join uh, our former student board member there. Kubariqua Rude of Friendly High School will be going to Pepperdine. Dale Russell of Bowie High School, Lafayette College. 
Daja Tyree of Fairmont High, Fairmont Heights High School will be going to Grinnell College. Since 2004, Posse DC has awarded 73 scholarships to students from Prince George's County, representing more than $7.8 million from Bucknell University, Grinnell College, Lafayette College, the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and Pepperdine University. Congratulations to all of you. Natalie Oliver, a junior at Blainsburg High School, is a recipient of the Honorable Arthur Dorman Scholarship given by the Chesapeake Bay Trust Trust Organization for her commitment to improving health of the environment in the Chesapeake Bay. Her exemplary leadership in promoting diversity and inclusion in her school community awarded her this honor. I want to congratulate Mr. Brian Weeks, a sixth grade math teacher at Greenville Elementary School, his, who is the recipient of the 2011-2012 Veterans of Foreign Affairs Teacher of the Year Award. He is currently competing for the National Veteran of Foreign Affairs Award for Teacher of the Year as well upcoming meetings that we think are very important tonight. Of course, we have a board meeting on February 9th at 1 p.m. as a system oversight meeting. February 16th at 5 p.m. we have our capital improvement program and finance audit and budget meeting. On February 21st at 5 p.m. we will continue with a budget work session here at Sasser. Again, it's tw on, on the same day we'll also have a public hearing on the operating budget that's been proposed by Superintendent Height. On February 23rd at 7 p.m. we have a board meeting. All persons interested to speak at board meetings are asked to register two and a half hours prior to the date, the time of the meeting, and you may call 301-952-6115. Please join me in a mo moment of silence for the following. Michael Thomas, a custodian at Thomas Poland Middle School. Shirley Williams, food service assistant at Francis Scott Key Elementary School. Tangelia Bundy, food service assistant at Duval High School. Daryl McCoy, son of Linda Moore, food service assistant at Forest Heights Elementary School. Thank you very much for that moment of silence. Dr. Height, I yield to you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and good evening to the chair and members of the board. I also want to begin by congratulating Mr. Watts for the fine job that he's done with the IT High School at Fairmont Heights. And I remember when this was just a notion for Mr. Watts, and he bugged us so long and so much that um, and, but to see his notion become a, a program where students will be equipped with the skills to be employed or to enter college has been quite remarkable. So I've been over there personally to see Mr. Watts and all of the students along with the principal and the teachers and those students are already uh, accomplishing great things. So I want once again congratulate you Mr. Watts on the success thus far in the IT program and the new distribution center that is at Fairmont Heights. I also want to take this opportunity to thank Mr. Coleman and the members of the communications staff for capturing the essence of that program and all of the other programs and the fine job that you're doing in keeping uh, the information about the good things that are happening with their students and with their schools in the forefront of, of everything that happens in that county. And I will join uh, the chair in congratulating uh, Whitehall Elementary School for their uh, acknowledgement and recognition and, and designation as a Blue Ribbon School. And I know that being in your district, Madam Chair, that is um, something for which you are extremely proud. We did have the opportunity to join staff members, parents, and actually some students from Whitehall last week down at MSDE where uh, that designation was made along with the other five. So congratulations to Mr. Campbell and his staff and the families and students at Whitehall. Paint Branch Elementary School will celebrate the opening of a new language lab for the Chinese Immersion Program with a ribbon cutting ceremony on tomorrow. This is the first school in the nation to offer a Chinese Immersion Program through science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. This program will offer our students full literacy in Chinese through immersed studies, giving them exposure to the language, culture, history, and government, as well as through the STEM-related fields. I'm also pleased to announce that we have partnered with the Prince George's County Fire and Emergency Medical Services Department to start training the next generation of firefighters and or emergency medical personnel. The high school fire science program will allow students to take college-level classes, as a matter of fact, Students who complete, complete that program will complete 
uh, up to 17 hours of college level work. That will enable them to work towards national certification in fire science or as an EMS worker. The program will be offered, the pallet program will be offered at Charles Herbert Flowers High School. Yesterday, we recognized 48 new national board certified teachers at the fifth annual pinning ceremony. I was joined by the vice chair, Ms. Higgins, as we recognized a total of 300, recognized 48 of our new national board certification, certified teachers who represent uh, 48 of the 304 teachers in our school district who have earned this certification through the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. This is the highest credential available to educators. So once again, congratulations to all of those individuals. Also this week, our secondary school reform team hosted a business community breakfast for more than 100 business leaders. During the meeting, we presented an overview of our secondary school reform work and discussed ways in which businesses can assist us in developing the development and sustainability of our career academies that will be located at all of our high schools. In the coming weeks, you will hear more about these initiatives. Finally, I am pleased to announce that our Education Foundation will host the second annual Golfing for Education tournament on June 27, so save the date, at the Country Club at Woodmore Golf Course in Mitchellville. The event will help raise funds to support both our students and our teachers. As always, I want to thank our parents, students, teachers, and administrators for their hard work and dedication. It is because of your tireless efforts that Maryland's state education system was recently ranked first in the nation for the fourth consecutive year. This honor could not be accomplished without the improvements we have made here in Prince George's County and without the support of this board. On behalf of our students, parents, and employees, I thank you. Madam Chair, this concludes my remarks. Thank you, Dr. Haidt. Colleagues, we do not have any registered speakers for a comment on agenda items at this time. I will call Mr. Lucci to come forward with the legislative update. Thank you, Mr. Lucci. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the Board of Education for Prince George's County. The General Assembly uh, came into session two weeks ago uh, today, and the uh, day that people were waiting for was the day last week when the governor introduced his budget. And so I want to tell you first the good news for uh, public education in the budget. First thing is that the um, Thornton Bridge to Excellence funding uh, was fully funded. Um, for many years, we had a fight about whether there would be an inflation factor, whether there would be geographic cost of education index, whether uh, the per pupil spending uh, per, uh, would remain uh, constant. Uh, it's, it's all fully funded. And the second piece of good news is that the um, school construction budget was increased from $250 million to $350 million. So there's a greater pot for Prince George's County to buy for. Um, now for the not so good news. Um, uh, for years, uh, there's been proposals to um, shift the cost of teacher pensions uh, from the state uh, to the uh, counties. And in fact, two years ago, the Senate passed a proposal that would actually shifted not to the counties, but to the boards of education. And, and each year, the governor said, I'm not uh, in favor of that. Uh, but this year, because of the, uh, the budget situation, his budget proposes to have the county and the state uh, shift, uh, 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 share equally the cost of both retirement and Social Security. And so it was not shifted to the board of education. It was shifted to the county governments. Uh, for Prince George's County, and that means a loss of $27,438,652. Uh, now, the governor um, also attempted to shift uh, certain revenues and, sa and expense savings uh, to the counties. And so the amount of um, uh, savings to the county, according to the governor's office, is also $27,438,652. Uh, down to the dollar. Uh, the, the concern of, of the county government and all the county governments is there's no assurance in future years that that revenue and, and, and uh, that revenue stream will be there and so they will have this additional uh, cost when they're already facing a shortfall. And so um, uh, this is one thing that Maryland Association of Counties and Maryland 
Association of Boards of Education is, uh, are joining together on. Uh, what they're not joining together on is um, legislation regarding maintenance of effort. Uh, there may be two competing bills uh, submitted to the General Assembly, one by Maryland Association of Counties, making it um, easier for a county to uh, appeal a decision uh, through not grant a waiver and either make it uh, 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 tougher to have um, the, the, the make, the make it make it tougher to, to not make the maintenance of effort requirement. And then there's going to be uh, probably legislation supported by Maryland Association of Boards of Education, hopefully with the support of the two presiding officers, um, that I'll have make, try and make it fair and, and reform the process and put the penalty where it belongs, and that is on the county governments and not on the boards of education. Uh, fortunately, with this county executive who uh, is intending to fully fund, um, as he says, as, he, uh, as long as he can, um, the school board's uh, request in the maintenance of effort level, we don't have that problem. Unfortunately, that's just one person, and I think it's important that the law reflect what is fair, and that's going to require some reform. Um, there are two bills before you uh, this evening that were both pre-filed bills that I submitted um, a couple weeks ago to the board, and um, the first one is House Bill 2, Public School Buildings, Carbon Monoxide Detection and Warning Equipment. Uh, this emergency bill requires that construction and remodeling of public school buildings conform to the National Fire Protection Association standards, which relates to the installation of, of carbon monoxide detection and warning equipment for commercial structures. It also expands an existing prohibition against charging a fee for permits necessary to comply with state and county building codes to compliance with the bill's requirement. Um, this bill is opposed by the Maryland Association of Boards of Education as an unfunded mandate. The real flaw of the bill is it does not say whether this is an eligible cost for the state to share in for school construction or school uh, remodeling. Because um, if it's not an eligible cost, the county, the school system would have to pay 100% of, of the cost. Uh, last year, this bill was withdrawn by the sponsor. Uh, this year, um, uh, they're starting earlier, and so uh, my recommendation on, on this bill would be to uh, oppose. Um, I'll go to the second one. Uh, House Bill Number Nine is a second bill: Education, Children, and Youth Implementation of Programs and Reporting of Information Concerning Student Health, Well-Being, and Growth. Uh, this bill requires each local board of education to include information on diabetes and its health education instruction, and to report information to the state superintendent of schools by September 1 of each year on the implementation of several state programs and initiatives, including the Personal Financial Literacy State Curriculum diabetes, health education, and lessons on dating violence. Uh, by December of each year, the Maryland State Department of Education must report to the Governor and the General Assembly on the information reported to the State Superintendent. And the bill takes effect July 1, 2012. Uh, this bill was introduced uh, two years ago and passed the House, passed the Senate, but they passed in different versions and so it failed on the last night. Um, the Maryland Association of Boards of Education opposed this bill because of the redundancy of additional requirements that are um, on top of requirements right now that already uh, address these issues. And so I recommend um, and oppose on that bill as well. Thank you, Mr. Lucci. Um, I have Ms. Rosalind Johnson, who's buzzed in. Ms. Johnson, are you prepared to speak on either of these bills or something else? Um, Mr. Lucci, your final statement uh, really did sum up uh, my notation. While I think there's no question that the health of children and the, uh, how they are doing clearly has to be a concern of all of us. My, con my issue is that in looking at the bill, it actually could be like three bills, really, because it, it has three distinct pieces that the oversight and how you do that, you would have to go at it in a different way. In addition to looking at diabetes, which clearly is on the rise, especially type 2, we need to be able to track that because it adds to our health insurance costs for families, et cetera. These things are important, but at the end of the day, we can have all this data, but how do we handle it? What do we do with it? what kind of funding will be coming out of it. And just to be a data collection source, the school system, our mission is to educate children. And while all of these things are very important, 
um, I am just concerned about the far broad range of what the bill is trying to get at. We want healthy children, no question. Um, but I think we're already collecting a lot of this data. We are using it through our health department, our nurses, and we have a health ed department here in the county, health education is part of the curriculum, that does address these things. Um, and so unless we have a process through the state paid for by the state um, that allows us to go to the next step, um, I, I think Prince George's is really tackling this issue. Um, and so I would agree with you um, that this is not something that I can support in this written format. Ms. Johnson, would you like to make a motion to that effect on that bill? Yeah. M Madam Chair, I move that uh, the board uh, take a no position on this bill. House Bill 9? The bill you just spoke about, right? No, yes. Okay. The, health, the health bill. Yes. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Ms. Higgins. It's probably moved and second that the board oppose House Bill 9, which is take no position. I'm sorry. Uh, take no position on House Bill 9, uh, which is education, children, and youth reporting of information concerning student health, well being, and growth. Is there any further discussion? Thing. Are you buzzing in, Mr. Mr. Armwood? Go right ahead, sir. I believe my, my understanding of the reason to oppose is that this is an unfunded mandate and that it would be a cost item to the school system. As a result, I would oppose a motion of no position and would counter propose a counter motion that we oppose the bill as proposed. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Armwood, uh, those are your comments. He has the, those are his comments with regard to the motion that's on the floor. Ms. Johnson, are you already willing at this point to change? No, what I'm not going to change okay. it. I just wanted to, to speak to why no position as opposed to um, oppose. Okay, go right ahead. Uh, I just, I believe that the intent has great merit for children and for what we are attempting to do. We are not opposed to doing that which gains us knowledge about having healthier children. To oppose it would say, we don't agree with the bill, the intent. And I don't think that's what we're saying. I think we're saying there are things about the way that it is written, unfunding, but the opposition to it is that we don't agree with it, at least for me. I do agree with what it is attempting to do, and I would much rather see us on the record as we do support anything that helps with good health for children, but it has to be crafted in a way that we can actually manage financially. Thank you for that explanation, Ms. Johnson. Any other comments? Seeing none, Ms. Dent, call the roll, please. The motion on the floor is to take no position. One House Bill 9. It's properly moved and second. On the motion, Mr. Armwood. No. Ms. Boston. No. Mr. Burroughs. Aye. Ms. Eubanks. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Aye. Ms. Waller. Aye. Ms. Jackson. No. Ms. Higgins? No. Ms. Jacobs? Aye. Motion failed. Thank you. Colleagues, is there another motion on House Bill 9? Mr. Armwood? I move that we oppose the bill as written. Second. It's been probably moved and second that we oppose House Bill 9 as, that is, as it is currently written. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, call the roll, Ms. Depp, please. On the motion, Mr. Armwood. Aye. Ms. Boston. Aye. Mr. Burroughs. No. Ms. Eubanks. Aye. Ms. Johnson. No. Ms. Waller. No. 
Ms. Jackson. Aye. Ms. Higgins. Aye. Ms. Jacobs. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, six ayes, three nays. Thank you. Uh, Chair recognizes Mr. Burroughs. Mr. Lucci, uh, I had a question about the first thing that you mentioned, and that was uh, teacher pensions being shifted to the locals. Uh, and I asked uh, Dr. Height the question at the last meeting, but, uh, and, and he answered, and the administration answered, but I feel like you would also be in a great position to say, uh, what is the appropriate step for uh, local advocates to uh, oppose this, uh, the shift? Well, the, um, the, the members of, the, the budget's gonna start in the Senate, so the members of the Senate from Prince George's County mm -hmm. uh, need to hear from you and from everyone else. And uh, what is the process for uh, having the board to take, take an official position uh, in opposition of the shift? Uh, I realize the, the board would probably have to vote on that. Well, it was, one, it was the first, um, the second plank of the uh, legislative agenda that the board did adopt um, earlier this month. And so uh, the board is on record opposing the, the shift. Well, I guess I'm, I'm talking about something that's, uh, I mean, that was a huge, uh, not huge, but that was uh, multiple uh, policy points that we took position on, but something more direct that would go directly to the senators of the budget committee uh, directly to the Prince George's senators so that we're clear uh, that, you know, this shift would uh, negatively impact the school system. I'd be glad to draft a letter for the chair's signature if the board would like to and deliver that. I personally would. Thank you. Uh, so as I understand it, um, colleagues, we already have opposed um, the shifting of the pension and have for several years now. Unfortunately, we are where we are. Um, so I, I don't think anyone on this board would have, would have an issue with us doing a separate letter, uh, Mr. Burroughs, that, that reiterates that fact. Um, but I would also say that while we're doing that, we need to continue that conversation about what that looks like for the district. And, and we had, we talked about that a little bit the other day too in terms of, um, you know, now that it's here, we also got to strategize about going forward. Um, colleagues, uh, we still have a bill on the floor, House Bill 2, which is the public school buildings, carbon monoxide detection and warning equipment. Is there a motion? I'll entertain. Mr. Armwood. I have a, my question is how can the intent of this bill actually is something that we should have more carbon monoxide detectors in our buildings. I would be very surprised if we did not have carbon monoxide detectors near our boilers and uh, kitchen equipment already. So, so I'm gonna have to yield to Dr. Hyde. And, and, and Dr. Hyde, I apologize because I didn't ask you your position on the last one, so here's an opportunity for you to let us that know. That was consistent you. with the board's action. I thought uh, so. The, um, Mr. Armwood, I don't have that information, but we do have staff that uh, will be able to respond to that. I don't know, Mr. Miles, if you want to respond, I see Mr. Belcher in the back. I don't know if Mr. Walker is here as well, but they're the individuals responsible for some of our inspections. Yeah, I think it's Carl has that information. Okay, so um, it sounds like colleagues want to know, Mr. Armwood wants to know the status of um, carbon monoxide detection in our school district, and based on that, um, we can decide what motion to put forth. Thank you, sir. The answer is uh, in most of our schools, we do not uh, have carbon monoxide detectors. Some of our new schools, uh, well, they were put in as part of the uh, construction process. Has there been any study as to what it will cost to provide, to put carbon monoxide detectors in, the, in our buildings? No. Uh, we need some guidelines as to whether they should be just around the boilers or points of uh, combustion. Uh, that's where they uh, normally are, are placed in a, a commercial facility. Or do we want them in each classroom, each hallway, corridor? Uh, we can get that estimate uh, given those guidelines but we don't have those estimates now. Ms. Armwood, I do know that we do have it in, in the kitchens, you know, as a part of the, the safety measure. Most of our kitchens have them. Um, we just don't, you know, like as Carl indicated, 
the older buildings, most of our older buildings don't, but the buildings I believe built between 2006 and now, they all do. What surprises me is I've bought two carbon monoxide detectors for my home, maybe 20 or $30 a piece. I realize that may not be commercially yeah, that's uh, a different viable, <laughs> but um, I think that there's something that should not have required legislation to make us do. Um, I'd like to propose that we support this bill, even though it's going to be an unfunded mandate. That's something that should have been done already. No, second. Com commercial is different. The motion, there's a motion on the floor to support House Bill 2 has been properly moved and second. Further discussion? Dr. Haidt, um, do you want to share with the board your position on this bill? Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And I'm not, um, I'm not speaking in, in favor of or in opposition to carbon monoxide uh, detectors. I personally think they should be everywhere we can uh, possibly provide them. But um, my, th the struggle with the bill is that, just as Mabe has highlighted, this is something that is mandated for us um, that would come with a, a fiscal note that uh, it w that would make it hard for us to then implement that. And I don't know what the code suggests, and I don't know if it's the 20 or $30 smoke detectors, Mr. Amwood, or more of a industrial type of uh, detector that we would need, but with the number of classrooms and hallways and spaces that we have, this would be something that would come, in my opinion, with a significant fiscal note. And unless there's the identification of the resources to support uh, such a bill, my recommendation would uh, be to oppose. Thank you, Dr. Height. I have Ms. Jackson and then Ms. Johnson. Um, so is the only source of discontent with this bill the fact that it would, it would require fiscal responsibility, or do we have anything else that makes us against it or you against it? My trouble with the bill, uh, Ms. Jackson, is because of the, um, the requirement for the monies that it would take in order to install this. And it's one thing to, for the board to take a policy to do this over a period of time, but once it becomes law, it becomes, um, it, it triggers a mechanism that makes it uh, required in every location. And then typically, if, when it becomes law, that's generally after the board approves their budget, so we would then have to redirect resources in order to do this. Okay, thank you. Well, personally, I find it to be an investment in my safety and my classmates' safety, so I will be supporting this bill. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Ms. Johnson, Mr. Armwood, and Ms. Oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Jackson, Ms. Boston. Ms. Johnson, Ms. Boston, and Mr. Um, Madam Chair, uh, Dr. Haidt uh, uh, explored what Thank I you. wanted to talk about. Ms. Boston. Mr. Lucci, is it any way that we can um, talk to the person that actually put the, the writer of this uh, um, legislative proposal to include maybe some type of financial uh, support for this? I mean, because, I mean, I agree that it's a good idea. I mean, just today I heard on the news that uh, there was a, quite a few people that got sick because of carbon monoxide. So I think it's important, but I do agree with the superintendent that it would be a burden on us as financially. Um, but, you know, I, I just want to see if there's some way we can look at other a avenues to support that. Sure, I mean, the, the lobbyist for the bill happens to be my office mate in Annapolis. Um, and I think if the bill said that it was an eligible cost for the state to share in for school construction or remodeling, so that it would, it would pay most of it and the local, the local school district would pay the rest, then that would be a fair bill because that's how all other elements of school construction and remodeling are done is in a sharing arrangement between the state and the county. And, uh, and this, but this doesn't say that. So. Mr. Armwood. I guess we will have to oppose the bill as written just simply because of the unfunded mandate, or can we table our consideration of it until we find out what it will cost? And failing that, I recommend that or ask that the superintendent determine costs and the proper way to provide carbon monoxide protection for our building and children. 
A few, a few years ago, I interject, I used to represent one of the two companies that makes uh, carbon monoxide detectors. And the cost is not so much the um, detector itself. The cost is the hard wiring from room place to place to place to place. That's where the real uh, cost comes in is, is, the, is the wiring, not the uh, detector itself. Dr. Height. The, the other thing, and I think Mr. Lucci uh, alluded to this as he was um, describing, as, as currently written, it doesn't specify whether or not construction dollars may be used, school mm -hmm. construction dollars may be used in order to do this. Um, I would be in a better position to support it if, in fact, we had a mechanism to support it through the use of some of our facility dollars. But without that um, being a part of the bill, it just makes it hard because, as Mr. Lucci just described, we would then have to absorb all of the costs to both wire and, uh, and install. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Height. Uh, Mr. Burroughs? It sounded like uh, Mr. Armwood was trying to change the motion, but I, uh, is, is that correct? Uh, that is correct. Um, considering the impact on the potential impact on the school system, I do withdraw the motion or modify it that we, well, we have to oppose it well, I, uh, with the comment, we need clarification as to how we can fund that change. Uh, Dr. Height, did I state your position basically? Correct. And in addition, I would like the, our system to determine the cost of providing carbon monoxide protection for our system. I just wanted to say that I had already seconded the motion, so it cannot be withdrawn, and we have to vote on it. Okay, so uh, Mr. Burroughs, I thought the only reason you brought that up was because you were willing to, to concede to what he was saying. I would have moved on. Um, having said that, the motion on, or, but he's withdrawn his motion. Is that proper, um, Ms. He made it, he withdrew it, Did even though it had a second. the individual who seconded also agree to the withdrawal? No. No. Okay, call the roll, Ms. Dent. The motion on the floor is to is to support House Bill Two. On the motion, Mr. Armwood. No. Sorry. Miss Boston. No. Mr. Burroughs. Aye. Miss Eubank. No. Miss Johnson. No. Miss Waller. No. Ms. Jackson. Aye. Ms. Higgins. No. Ms. Jacobs. No. Motion failed. Seven ayes, two nays. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, seven nays, two ayes. Thank you. Um, Dr. Thank Height, you. I think it's appropriate then um, for our next CIP, maybe not the next one, but in the February or March CIP meeting, if we could add to the agenda. If staff can, um, at that time, come bring back that information to the board for um, consideration. Madam, Madam Chair, do you wish a motion to uh, have this held in abeyance until we get? No, we just had a, we have what held in abeyance. Because we. You've taken no action essentially now on. Oh, correct. The, okay, that's what I just wanted to know. Okay. Uh, Ms. Higgins. I'd like to make a motion to oppose um, House Bill 2. Um, for public school buildings, car carbon monoxide detection and warning equipment. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved and second that we oppose House Bill 2. Hearing no further discussion, call the roll, Ms. Dent. Mr. Armwood. Aye. Ms. Boston. Aye. Mr. Burroughs. No. Ms. Eubanks. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Aye. Ms. Waller. Aye. Ms. Jackson. No. Ms. Higgins. Aye. Ms. Jacobs. Aye. Motion carries seven ayes, two nays. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lucci, do you have anything else for us? Uh, nothing further. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your weekly reports and for your presentation at our board meetings. Keep us informed. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Height, at this time, I will yield the floor to you for discussion items. Thank you, Madam Chair. This presentation 
is a uh, presentation of the results of the Transportation Task Force. And I want to provide this evening, thank you. If we could pull the, thank you. So I want to provide a historical context of the task force. Uh, just so that um, the board is aware of why we moved uh, in this direction. The Department of Transportation has made some notable strides since the 1998 performance audit report from MGT. The use of a computerized routing system, a data management system that provides detailed and specific information about students served, and stronger linkage to the student information systems are among some of the improvements. However, as we realized during the previous year's uh, budget conversation, there's still much work to be completed in terms of having a student transportation system that optimizes efficiencies at every level. The task force's charge was to capture these opportunities for improvement. In addition, last year, as the budget requirements loom large, the prospect of eliminating transportation for specialty programs was raised. Though the need for such a move was averted, the demand to reorganize to provide a more cost-efficient service is still very much a reality, and not just a reality for our young people who attend the specialty centers, but for our entire uh, transportation system. To provide some context for uh, the annual budget associated with transportation, as you can see on this slide, we transport roughly 65.5% of our students, or 81,223. Those are the number of students who are transported daily. They are transported um, with 1,096 regular bus runs. Uh, each bus, I'm sorry, we have 1,375 buses in our fleet. Those buses average an average of 19.5 uh, million miles traveled each year. That's the total amount of miles traveled by all of the buses. They consume 2.9 million gallons of fuel. And why is it so much? Because um, although diesel and efficient, they only achieve seven miles per gallon. And we have uh, approximately 2,051 transportation staff members. One of the things I think is important is the reason why this study was so important. And the study is important because, as this next slide shows, the student enrollment has, de has been on a steady decline since FY09. As a matter of fact, you can see the difference there is about 4,000 students just in that four-year period of time. However, as you think about transportation, since during the same period of time, we've seen an increase in the actual budget for the transportation of our young people. That's due naturally um, to the cost of fuel, the cost of doing business in terms of compensation, and if we have more employees or you're adding employees, naturally compensation goes up. And then something I'm going to talk about in detail later just the efficiency or inefficiency of our, our, route, our routing practices. The next slide uh, demonstrates uh, the expenditures that over the past several years, where expenditures typically exceed budget amounts. And you can see every year the uh, column on the left side is what we budget, and the column on the right side is what we end up spending. And as you can see this year, we're, while we budgeted for um, a, a greater amount, we are also quickly um, moving our current year expenses to, to match that, that budget amount. So I want to talk about the task force. And as a result of the task force and their meeting, there were a set of recommendations, but I think it's important really to acknowledge the individuals who um, served on that task force. And there was, the task force um, was designed to look at um, several areas. And as I indicated earlier, the whole purpose was to look at how to realize efficiencies inside of our transportation system. 
we had subcommittees that focused on bell times, boundaries, the county infrastructure, ridership, particularly an analysis of ridership to determine if in fact our buses were being used to the greatest efficiency. Routing, the routing subcommittee, specialized programs, stop placement, this committee actually performed assessments on whether or not the stops were appropriately and efficiently placed. Community review, and then there were a set of individuals who were responsible for the development uh, of the documents, and they were also a part of the management operations support team. I also want to highlight that several members of the board were a part of the task force, along with other elected officials, community members, business representatives, and individuals who are employed within that transportation department. On the Boundary Planning Subcommittee, Board Member Rosalind Johnson uh, served on that. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. On the County Infrastructure Subcommittee, Board Member Henry Armwood served as a member. Thank you, Mr. Armwood, for your service. And on the Stop Placement Assessment Subcommittee, Board member Edward Burroughs was a member of that. Mr. Burroughs, thank you for your work. We also have two individuals, I understand, who are with us who also served as a part of the Transportation Task Force Committee. Francine Parks, foreman at the Forestville Bus Lot, Department of Transportation. Ms. Parks, are you here? Great, could you stand? Thank you, and keep standing, Ms. Parks. And Dominique Turner, budget management, Analysts, Office of Management and Budget, great. Thank you for what you have done on the Transportation Task Force and to the board members who served on that task force as well. But, so the committee's recommendations were defined in three major categories. Short term, indicating immediate implementation. And this means that in many cases, the administration has already engaged uh, our staff members in this work. Long-term recommendations. The long-term recommendations are indication that there are more extensive planning and coordination types of activities and strategies that must occur, particularly among and between agencies. And the ongoing recommendations, and these require efficiency planning by transportation department as it relates to its core services and deliverables. So these next few slides are actual recommendations from the committees, and I want to, I'm going to talk about each of these slides. And as I describe these, as you can see, those short-term things are things that are either already in progress as a part of the work that we began after last year's budget development process, or those things that are classified or determined long-term, which will take a lot more planning as we move forward. So from the committee that uh, addressed our, looked at our bell times, they made several recommendations. And there are potentially yearly savings. And I want um, everyone to understand as we looked at this, we were really looking for opportunities to operate more efficiently. I also want to remind the board members and all of the public that the complete report has been placed on board docs so that it's available for everyone in its entirety. But there are potential yearly savings of up to $70,000 for each bus eliminated from our system's daily fleet. We currently have 13 bell times with 5,888 trips per day that use 1,096 buses, including alternative dedicated, midday, non-public, and special education routes. So as a comparison, I think it's really important to just use another system. And I'll, I'll use Montgomery County. Now, Montgomery County has four bell times with 3,888 trips while using 740 buses. In addition, as all of you know, they transport 20,000 more students daily than we do. Administration is currently working on adjusting bell schedules of middle and high schools to achieve savings as a result of sharing routes where it's appropriate. 
A simulation of new bell times will be completed within the next month in order to correctly estimate, estimate the number of buses that can be eliminated. Parents, students, and staff will be notified of new bell time changes and transportation changes by early March in anticipation for the 2012-2013 school year. The next slide is or are the recommendations from the committee that were studying and wanted to address the school boundaries. And the boundary planning subcommittee recommended pursuing a cost saving strategy centered on increasing the number of walkers in already established walking boundaries. In addition, the committee noted that the 64 passenger buses are only operating at 48% capacity. There are several avenues we will take to aid in improving the overall space usage of each bus, such as consolidating stops, rerouting buses, and or utilizing a model that factors in pupils not using the transportation system. The state of Maryland does not require school systems to provide bus services to pupils if they live within a one and a half to two mile radius, depending on grade level, of course. Thus, if walking boundaries around schools were more efficient, effectively utilized, the savings could be significant. For instance, according to our projections, a 25% increase in walkers would provide an estimated savings of $10.7 million in the Department of Transportation's FY 2012 budget. Additional variables will be discussed under the county infrastructure recommendations later in the presentation. The subcommittee that looked at the county infrastructure and they made a couple of long and short term recommendations as well. The county infrastructure subcommittee recommended reducing the school system's 13 bus lots to three mega lots for the Department of Transportation. This recommendation was consistent with the MGT uh, audit that was completed in 1998. This consolidation would reduce annual operating costs by millions of dollars for the Department of Transportation while enhancing the quality of student services and reducing overtime costs by 4.5 million within the department. The Department of Transportation provided data indicating that approximately 1,500 stops were created due to a lack of sidewalks. While many of these locations are in rural areas, many surprisingly are also located within the developed part of the county. The next slide are the recommendations from the subcommittee that was tasked with decreasing the dependence on student transportation. This committee recommended coordinating with local county and state public works departments to provide sidewalks in areas where pupils live within walking distance to schools. During the zoning and development process, it was recommended that planners Consider whether new residential development is smart growth based on the proximity to the nearest elementary, middle, and high school. A potential source of funding for new sidewalks could also be a portion of the revenues collected from speed cameras placed near schools for safety reasons. The next slide talks about routing and how we could go about increasing routing efficiency. The routing system that is currently in place provides basic capabilities. However, it also allows for the routing of a very large fleet, but it does not provide for route optimization. We are currently engaged in the process of evaluating routing software with the goal of implementing in the 2012-13 school year that would help us better optimize the routes that uh, constructed inside of our routing system. This next slide really deals with a long-term recommendation around addressing the level of service for specialty programs. The subcommittee again supported recommendations made in 1998 by the MGT consultants and proposed again last year to change the level of service for specialized programs to centralized stops at schools or other community facilities. This proposal would significantly reduce the number of buses that serve each specialized program. 
It's important to note, however, that the administration is currently reviewing the option of specialty students riding the bus to their neighborhood school and a hub system that will transport those students to a specialty center. This is a longer term strategy and I want to emphasize that. We're looking at piloting this at one of our specialty centers next year. And we're proposing that the pilot be at Middle College. And then we will be able to then gain information from what we learn from that pallet before suggesting that that move out to the other specialty centers. So I want to emphasize for all of our specialty centers next year, this transportation would still operate very much as it operates this year. The next uh, recommendation dealt with the subcommittee that addressed the operational practices to ensure better efficiency. And I think here, this is pretty self-explanatory, but I think it's also important to note, and this was information contained in the Lodger report. 75% of our current bus stops serve fewer than five students. And on average, 3.8 students are at every bus stop. That means that before a bus is half full, it, it has to stop 10 times. Um, and that is part of the inefficiency that is um, designed inside of our current routing system where we want to really address these operational issues just by looking at our ability to better optimize the routes that are recommended from the routing software. So the Transportation Task Force Committee, um, this is the recommendation list uh, and the response. And our response to this really are the things that we intend to do. Uh, some of those, as I indicated before, are short-term types of um, strategies, while others are very long-term strategies that will require coordination and collaboration with other county services and in some cases with other state services in order to better make our transportation system more efficient. And we want to also implement a communication plan with parents to adjust the expectations for bus service and bus stop placement. The Department of Transportation will adjust its operational practices to take better advantage of existing latitude in bus routing and bus stop placement. Specifically, the number of stops serving fewer than eight students will be aggressively reviewed for consolidation where conditions permit. The targeted walk distance to bus stops will be adjusted to approximate an average distance of one half to two thirds of a mile rather than one fourth mile currently used with student safety being monitored and maintained. And finally, want to end with the final list of uh, recommendations and our uh, responses. And as with all of our other work, it is important to make this a part of our comprehensive performance management plan uh, for student transportation. And this is so that we can provide for the board and the public a detailed plan that describes the date on which we will have all of these recommendations um, completed. And it also includes improved oversight, especially as it relates to management and supervision of transportation, and improve internal and external communications, both within the transportation department, but also to our community and the public as well. So with that, that concludes the recommendations of the Transportation Task Force Staff and I will be glad to entertain uh, questions from the board. Ms. Johnson. Um, just a notation, Dr. Height. Um, while the uh, PowerPoint that you have is very lovely, the reality is that it is actually a reiteration of a major NGT report from 1996, there was nothing different. Um, maybe the words are 9th of 2012, but the report is exactly the same. And it ended, that 
comprehensive report ended with, unless the Board of Education makes the decision that it will implement, the problems and issues will continue. It is about the will of the board to do that which is financially important, valuable to free up resources and that we will end door to door taxi Cadillac style service. These are the words of the MGT report. And so I would say one, I'm very appreciative of having sat diligent people, but the work was the same, same conversation. And we are arriving back at the same point. We all know what the problem is. We know what we must do. And so it is my hope that the Board of Education will at long last do what we truly know Painful though it is, changing and causing upset, we got to do it. Thank you for those comments, Ms. Johnson. And I do want to um, recognize a distinction in the approach. And you're right, many of the recommendations were the same. But in that 1998 uh, report from MGT, the recommendations were only to the Board of Education. And it then became only the responsibility of the Board of Education to address those issues, and some, as you indicated, were hot button issues and are today. But we also wanted to include individuals at other levels of government who also have to be a part in making some of these recommendations come to fruition. And that's, a re that's the reason why we included multiple individuals from multiple groups, from county government, from the elected officials at the county level from uh, different services at the state level because there was a recognition that while this is gonna be a heavy lift for the Prince George's County Board of Education, there are also other parties who must be involved in doing this. The other part of this is that we've begun to address some of these issues as all of those things that you saw as short term, we are addressing right now. The longer term things, we do also want the board to have a detailed action plan for what we are going to do, along with what we're going to ask every other agency to do in timelines associated with that. Thank you, Dr. Height. Ms. Jackson? Um, so when, when you say sending students to hub schools, as a, is that just as a way of combining routes and no, it's different than the hubs that were dis described a year ago. So this would be a, um, and we're uh, palating this with one school, as I indicated. So I want to make sure, you know, there's not mass hysteria and, and we have signs up and that kind of stuff. But I do think it's really important to describe it. So this would be a hub system that, where students are transported to that boundary school. And I picked up at that boundary school to go to the specialty center. And we're going to pilot that with one school. It's going to be middle college. And um, then we will be able to gain information from how that works and what type of adjustments we would have to make with bell times in order to make that work. So how does this hub school plan compare to um, s just simply combining the bus routes for these specialty programs? Because it's, it's if I'm understanding correctly, you're saying that they're, they're going on one bus to the school and then one bus to the program, or? Yeah, so you have to, you can't think about it from the perspective of like for what each student would have. So you would have, if a bus goes into a neighborhood, so right now we're sending two buses into a neighborhood. In some cases, we're sending three and four buses into a neighborhood if multiple students from those neighborhoods go to different schools. Now we would be sending one bus into a neighborhood. All of those students would be transported to that boundary school. And then we would have buses that go from boundary school to boundary school to pick students up to take them to the specialty center. Okay, I see what you're saying. It makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Mr. Burroughs. Uh, Dr. Hyde, I really want to thank uh, your staff and the committee, uh, Ms. Johnson, Mr. Armwood, uh, from the board. Um, you know, during these meetings, 
uh, you know, I had a scheduling conflict. So I want to thank the members of the board who uh, really stepped up on this. Uh, I want to say that um, uh, this is able to save over $10 million, and that money we desperately need to go uh, to the classroom. And so I'm really excited about it, and I hope the board would uh, support this. Thank you, Mr. Burroughs. Ms. Wallace. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, certainly um, appreciate the work of my colleagues and the uh, Prince George's community on uh, the work they've done on the uh, Transportation Task Force. And we do know that it, we need change. And of course, throughout the report, there were various instances where we've been working on for a period of time. And we haven't arrived yet, uh, and it's ongoing. I have a question, uh, several questions. One, we, we talk about coordinating our efforts with uh, Department of Public Works and the bus and the transporting of our students. Um, I know we get a lot of, there's concern about our students' behaviors. Have we thought about what the school responsibility would be insofar as those students riding that bus? Um, that's the first question. Uh, the second is a number of years ago, uh, we had a system that was called the trapeze system. And I'm sure some of us have been around be familiar with trapeze. So my question is, how does that fit into what we're doing? Is that an old system now? We're we going to do away with it? Or what, what is that all about? Uh, or where we are with that program? The third question is, <clears throat> I believe it was on page 14, uh, about piloting student IDs. And we put it down as long term. Uh, in the past, we've had discussion about using uh, student IDs for several different pur purposes. And it's always, you know, we talk about it and using them in various manners. And I see that it's still long term here. Where are we with use piloting student IDs for even the bus, for using the new transportation system? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Waller. In terms of the first question about our use or our continued use of the bus, which is the county system, DPWNT was an active member of the task force. They were great in terms of helping us think about how we could leverage that resource. So this, the bus is still actually an option for us. Um, we can only use to do it in certain hours. And so for us, that sometimes prohibits whether or not our students can make full use of that particular um, service. But that, that option is still definitely on the table. We're actually looking to see if there's a way even for our children who have work and study assignments to use the bus during those hours as opposed to us actually transporting those students. So we are working with DPWNT on that particular initiative. In terms of trapeze, that is still our routing system as we currently speak today. We are evaluating that system as well as other systems to make sure that we have the routing system that best optimizes our routes. Uh, Prince George's is a little different in terms of the square miles that we actually have and, and the complexity of the county. And so the optimization piece is really important in terms of making sure that as we have various programs that we're also routing more efficiently. So we are still using trapeze, but we are evaluating other programs and systems to see if there's one that could better suit our needs. And in terms of student IDs, uh, most of our high schools are using student IDs, but this would be a system that would have to be integrated with an onboard system on the buses. So we would have to look at whatever routing system, but also whatever student ID system we would decide to use, how we could use that system on our buses so that students could swipe. The reason that that's important is it would give us an accurate ridership which is something that we're really trying to make sure as we look at stops and whether or not to eliminate a stop, are there children that are actually actively using that stop every day? So that's a long-term goal for us because we couldn't implement it by the 2012-13 school year, but we are actively progressing that one as well. Thank you. Uh, the, um, back to the first question, and we were talking, uh, asked about the behaviors that some of our students are associating on the bus as it is now, we receive complaints, and uh, this is once our students leave school. And of course, if we do a coordination of efforts with the bus as a result of the new transportation plan, what is the school responsibility once these students leave their designated school? Are, is, the, is the bus going to be our designated 
bus just for Prince George's County students, or is it still going to be public transportation during the hours of, what did you say, two to five or whatever like that? No, ma'am, it would still be public transportation, and we certainly have to work out how to make sure the drivers could notify of any um, unruly behavior, and we would help we would help them with that process, but it would still would be public transportation that would have not only students but also public community members on the bus as well. And so we could not take the position that because the students are not on school property that it's out of our perimeter of um, I guess admonishing the students or dealing with their behaviors. We may not be at that point yet because, I mean, I just received a question about the behavior of some of our students on the buses and what they were doing, and I hear about it in some of the other jurisdictions also. But if we're going to set up something with the bus that's particular to our school system, have we arrived at what's going to happen and whose responsibility or liability will it be? And Ms. Waller, it sounds based upon your question that you really look into how far we can extend our arm for disciplinary purposes if the children are riding, riding public transportation yes. for school buses. Yes. Yeah, so that, that is an issue that you know we are looking at and we are reviewing, um, much as when we have issues of children involved in you know different matters en route to home, mm -hmm. um, whether or not the school's jurisdiction can extend into those areas. So one of the things you always have to look at is whether or not the whether or not the, the action in itself has some nexus to the school environment. And I would think that that same analysis would apply to conduct occurring you know, on, on a bus route if, it, if students were using public transportation. But that is an issue that we would have to review and research and come back with further recommendations. And that's something that we could, um, we could benchmark from some of our surrounding districts, Ms. Walla. I mean, in Baltimore, in Washington, D.C., in the district, and even in Montgomery to some degree, when, when students ride the metro, I mean, so, it, and they go to and from school, we could um, find out from them how they approach that um, to Mr. Thomas's point. Thank you, Ms. Waller. Ms. Higgins. Yes, thank you. Um, Dr. Height, could you talk a little um, further about the savings that we will achieve in overtime? You said $4 million, is that correct? Yeah, that was from, I believe that was on the routing um, efficiency slide, and that is um, just with overtime alone, we could, if we had more efficient routing and we were better able to optimize um, that work, then it would be a $4.5 million reduction in overtime costs. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Mr. Armwood. Ms. Higgins, just as an amendment to that, that would be the, um, that's the result of consolidating the 13 lots to three. So that would be a result of going from, going towards the mega bus lots with more individuals. And it makes sense because right now we're replicating staffs 13 times. Um, and the, the staff who operate those um, bus lots, if you will, if we went to three mega lots, naturally it takes fewer people to run uh, the mega lot, it would just be where buses would then uh, be, sto be maintained. So that would be the reduction in um, the overtime cost just by going from 13 to three lots. And I would think then as well that you would have a larger pool of staff to be able to be responsive to situations than the staff you have at 13 different lots, which would then almost force overtime. Yeah. in and certain circumstances. Correct, and not only that, we would also have adequate uh, spaces for individuals to repair and maintain uh, the buses as well. As you know, there are several bus um, depots now that do not even have indoor facilities, so individuals ha must repair and, and work on buses out in the elements because we don't have um, bays or garages for them to pull the buses into. Mr. Armwood. Thank you. When will we have the timeline and action plans for the individual action items? Mr. Armwood, we're working on those action plans now. We should have them by the next CIP FAB meeting to present to you. Okay, thank you. 
my next question is, why was the middle college chosen as a trial? The reason I ask that I'm surprised is that it's a, it's a very small sample, first of all, and it was established with no transportation or no expectation of transportation for those children. Are they receiving bus transportation yes, now? Yes, sir, they are. As a matter of fact, next oh, okay. year we moved to 200 students, and so the committee actually thought that it would be a really good pilot to work in terms of the hub because all of those students could then go to their high school, catch a bus from the high school, and it's a small enough population that we could actually contain it. Um, and then the other part about middle college as we're looking at the numbers is that most of those children are coming from pretty large geographic areas, and so we thought that was another way for us to look at the hub system and, and really use a real-life simulation to conceptualize it. And I'm sorry, I thought that we were not providing transportation for those students. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Armwood. Colleagues, any further comments, questions, discussions on this issue? Seeing none, Dr. Height. Thank, Thank you, you Madam Chair. Report. The next item, uh, items under consent agenda, item 7.1 to 7.3. Thank you, Dr. Height. I have had a request to move item 7.3 to the non-consent agenda. Um, so that item will be handled under 9.1. 7.3 has been moved to 9.1 at the request of Ms. Johnson. <clears throat> With that being the case, um, colleagues, I'll entertain a motion to um, on item 7.1 and 7.2 if there is one. 7.1, 7.2. So moved. Ms. Johnson and Mr. Armwood, I need you to pay attention. Is there a second? So moved. Second. Thank you. It's been properly moved and second that we approve item 7.1 and 7.2 on the consent agenda. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any objections or abstentions? Seeing none, motion pass. Colleagues, we're moving to items. Uh, Dr. Height? Then we we'll move to budget consent or take the no. non-consent? Uh, I think we still have 7.4 through 7.8. Yes. I didn't so know if there was anything you wanted to Consent agenda, and these are charter schools, so I, I guess these are Item 7.4 to 7.8, these are the approval of the contracts with their various charters. Thank you, Dr. Height. Um, colleagues, is there a motion? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Waller. Second. It's been properly moved and second that we approve consent agenda item 7.4 through 7.8. All in favor? Any objections or abstentions? Seeing none, the motion pass. The next are uh, a set of budget consent agenda items, Madam Chair, they're items 8.1 to 8.14. Thank you, Dr. Hyde. Colleagues, is there a motion? I make a motion to accept. Thank you, Ms. Waller. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Thank you, Ms. Eubanks, to accept items 8.1 through 14, budget consent agenda items. All in favor? Aye. Any objections or abstentions? Seeing none, the motion passed. Okay, Dr. Height, that brings us to item 9.1, which was moved from um, the consent agenda 7.3. I yield to Ms. Johnson. Ms. Johnson? Yes. Um, Madam Chair, uh, today we received uh, commentary um, from the school and I gave it to uh, Mr. Um, Coleman, our <coughs> communications officer, uh, because there could not be persons here tonight to speak in favor of this. We're uh, on the naming of the school, right? No, Ms. Oh. Johnson. We're on 7.3, the item that you asked to have moved please, from the consent agenda. Please forgive agenda. me. I'm, I'm anticipating that we're not going to be here all night. I'm so sorry, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Height, with regard to the jock contracts, I have a single question, and that question is, what is the anticipated amount of business in 2012-2013 that you have for these contracts, because I looked at the categories um, that you had, you had plumbing and heating, and and you had major, and you had. Uh, what do you anticipate we will be spending this year? Some miles. 
we're preparing the schedule right now for the summer to see what, what particular um, renovations and, and whatnot. So part of what, what the JOC contract does is it gives the ability of the, the, the contractors that um, we select to be able to go and compete amongst themselves so that we can get those projects started. So all of those little summer projects that really need to happen right away um, that we put on the agenda for April, similar to what we did on the last JOC contract about three years ago, we identified all those contracts through requirements that they met all the basic requirements with regard to construction, the skill set, um, whether they're Prince George's County, minority, subcontractors, um, and we just made sure that they had the skill set to, to be able to perform. And we evaluated them through two different phases. Number one, we evaluated them based on, on the criteria and the requirements, whether or not they had the skill set. The second, we actually listened to their presentation. And out of, um, I believe, 20 some odd companies, we ended up selecting three different tiers. The first tier is companies that would perform jobs that are a million dollars. The second is those that would perform jobs that are uh, up to 750, and the last one basically is 250, but they could go up as they improve their service. Um, they would be able to move into the 500 to $750,000 range. So what it did was it gave us the ability to tap into a wide range of companies that provide different services. Um, and also, at the same time, we're meeting the, the minority business goals as it relates to um, companies that are in Prince George's County companies that are minorities and companies that, right. for example, handle work orders. Okay. Ms. And Ms. Johnson, well, I just want to add that it, these are generally used in uh, situations where there are emergencies no, or whether I, we don't I, have staff I available. I got that. And mm -hmm. while we don't have an estimate for what we could do, uh, don't have an estimate for the current year, what we could do is provide the board with what we've spent the last several years and on job if contracts. if I could add, because I think I've been pretty consistent. I have a real problem with job contracts. I am old enough to remember when we had the shops here in Prince George's. We had carpentry, we had painting, we had all that. What I'd like to Ms. know Johnson, is- Mr. Johnson, you know we still have those. Well, still. I understand, but at a much lower level of work that they do. What I'd like to know is within the next three to six months, if the board could have um, a report on how much cost saving we are realizing doing it through jock contracts of all kinds, as opposed to having employees who actually do the work in the system and paying them the necessary benefits because it concerns me um, that we in Prince George's, we did this work interior. These were our employees, they were committed to the school system, and we maintained them. And as a result, our buildings are still standing today because of the quality of work they did. But if you can provide that information that shows this is a better way to do it, um, rather than looking at over time rebuilding what we used to have. Um, it, this is just a concern of mine. It is probably not shared by anyone else, but it is one that I really would like to see the data as to whether or not we are doing well by having job contracts. That was the only reason to pull it, Madam Chair, is to, to, to get an understanding of our reliance on jocks as opposed to having the work done by our employees. And we don't have to worry about minority employment because we'll know how to do that. Thank you very much, Ms. Johnson. Points well taken. Um, on that note, is there a colleague, uh, is there a motion, colleagues, with regard to 7.3, or at, which is now 9.1 on the agenda? I make a motion to accept. Thank you, Ms. Waller. Is there a second? It's been properly moved and second. Thank you, Mr. Armwood, that we accept now 9.1. Um, accepting Ms. Johnson's comments and recommendation to the superintendent with regard to that item. Yes. All in favor? Aye. Uh, any objections or abstentions? Seeing none, motion passed. Thank you. 
Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. That brings us to item 10.1, the re renaming of the Francis Fuchs Early Childhood Center Media, Early Childhood Center Media Center to the Rita Manila Media Center. Thank you, Dr. Height. Um, chair recognizes board member Roslyn Johnson. As I said, Madam Chair, the uh, commentary uh, to be placed in the um, minutes of the board have been submitted because no one was able to be here from Francis Fuchs. Um, and the proclamation for naming of the library in honor of Ms. Ms. Rita Manella. Excuse uh, we me, Ms. Johnson, the principal is here. Oh, sh oh great, because she didn't think she was going to be able to make it. Okay. Ms. Deirdre Trammell is principal of Francis Fuchs. Good evening, Fuchs. board members, and thank you for this opportunity. Okay, he's telling me to summarize, so I will just say that <laughs> <laughs> in interest of time, Ms. Rita Manella uh, was an employee of Prince George's County Public School System for over 15 years. For the past 11 years, since being the principal of Francis Fuchs, I had the honor of working with her. We nominated her as a school community, entire staff, and uh, the families that she impacted for the Prince George's County uh, Supporting Personnel, uh, Supporting Employee Award back in 2010, I believe, and the red carpet at, the, uh, at Martin's Cross when she won that award. Uh, she was an indelible part of our, our school community, and she gave of herself tirelessly. She passed. Uh, last July 2011, uh, but during her tenure there, she was able, with along with the teacher that, with whom she worked, to transform our media center into a state-of-the-art, uh, developmentally appropriate uh, learning environment for our preschool-aged children. When I arrived at Francis Fuchs, there was no such uh, program in place. We had books in a room that was divided off with several people sharing office space. There were books on the shelves of copyrighted 1950s. And she had a vision along with uh, the other teachers in the building to say, if you just give us some money, and we began that effort of seeking out community partnerships. Councilman um, Thomas Ernoga started us off with a $20,000 uh, donation that with which we were able to buy some technology and some books. and. Uh, if you come and visit us now, you will see what the results of her efforts have been. So uh, we would like to rename our media center, uh, the Rita Manella Media Center at Francis Fuchs Early Childhood Center. Great, thank you very much. When uh, Ms. Johnson <coughs> frantically called alerting us of this um, request, and she was very much in support of it. We wanted to make sure that we were able to make that happen. So thank you so much for yes. your commitment also to Francis Fuchs. On that note, uh, Ms. Johnson, did you have anything further? Um, Madam Chair, I'm not gonna read the proclamation. I um, respectfully request of the members of the Board of Education um, that we rename the library at Francis Fuchs Early Childhood Center in honor of Rita Manila. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. I second. Thank you, Ms. Probably, Ms. Boston has been properly moved and second that we accept um, item, <clears throat> excuse me, 10.1, a renaming of Francis Fuchs Media Center to the Rita Manella Media Center. All in favor? Aye. Any objections or abstentions? Seeing none, the motion passed. Congratulations. Thank you, Dr. Hyde. Next item. Thank you, Madam Chair. The next item is under the emergency item. It is the FY 2012 financial review. And at this time, I'll have Mr. Stansky um, walk us through uh, why this is here uh, this evening. Thank you, Dr. Hyde, uh, members of the board. This is um, usually one of the first of two financial reviews that we do for the current fiscal year. It is for board approval tonight. Um, it is a, a reduction in, appropriate, in an appropriation of roughly $12.6 million. And again, the reason for that reduction is 
lower than anticipated costs in non-public placement. So that's revenue that was budgeted by the state originally, but it's, a, again, a reimbursable account. So if we're not spending the money, we don't get it. So we are, again, not anticipating spending what the state thought we were going to spend in non-public. So we are um, going to ask the county for a reduction in appropriation of the $12.6 million. Um, but within that uh, reduction, there are um, some transfer requests between um, between categories, which requires board approval, and then ultimately over to the county executive and then to the county council for approval as well. Um, the list of those transfers are listed in the board action summary. We'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you, Mr. Stansky. Um, colleagues, you've had an opportunity to read the background information with regard to this item. Are there any, uh, is there a motion <clears throat> and a second for discussion? I make a motion to accept the report. Thank you, Ms. Waller. Is that to approve this item 12 point yes. Thank yes. you. Is there a second? Is there a second to the motion? Yes, Thank you. It's been properly moved and second that we approve item 12.0 discussion. Ms. Higgins? Yes, Mr. Stansky, is um, this the item that would uh, uh, give a one time um, payment to employees? There are funds in this in this resolution set aside to negotiate with our bargaining units a one time payment to all employees of a half percent. Um, bonus, um, mm -hmm. but again, that would have to be negotiated with each bargaining unit, and also would have to get, like I said, council county um, council approval. Approval. Yes. Okay, but it does not include the non-union employees. Is that correct? Does not. Uh, yeah, it does not include the non-union employees in this. So, uh, if we wanted to include the non-union employees, it would um, we'd pass this motion and do an amendment, or how would that work, Madam Chair? Uh, it could work one of two ways. We could um, we could um, vote on the motion that's on the floor and then we could have a subsequent motion. Okay. Two. two. We're better okay. with two. The motion on the floor is to approve item 12.0, uh, which is the fiscal year 2012 financial review. Um, I, have, I have a motion and a second. Any further discussions? Seeing none, all in favor? Uh, Aye. Any objections or abstentions? Motion passed. Ms. Higgins. Yes, I would like to um, make a motion that we include um, the 0.5% one time only. I'm looking at you, Mr. Stansky, to make sure I say this correctly, uh, to include non-union employees. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Is there a second? Mr. Second. Burroughs? Okay. Okay. Is there a second? Second. It's been properly moved and second. Um, to include non-union employees in this financial review process that's being submitted uh, to the council for approval. Um, discussion, Mr. Burroughs. Uh, Mr. Stancy, just for clarification, uh, non-union is uh, everyone else. So does that include uh, chiefs and uh, directors? Yeah, so it's about, right now, it's about 82 employees in the district, so yeah, it's, uh, all senior management positions, chiefs, director level positions. Okay. Ms. Higgins? Yes, thank you, um, Madam Chair. Um, my interest in making this motion is because um, last year the 10 month and 11 month employees were furloughed four days and the 12 month employees were furloughed 10 days. Uh, this year the non union employees were furloughed three days. And um, I think that they have worked equally as hard as all the other employees and um, should also receive the one-time um, payment. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Any further discussion? Seeing none, Ms. Dent, call the roll, please. On the motion, Mr. Armwood. Aye. Ms. Boston. Aye. Mr. Burroughs. Aye. Ms. Eubank. Aye. Ms. Johnson. Aye. Ms. Waller. Aye. Ms. Jackson. Aye. Ms. Higgins. Aye. Ms. Jacobs. Aye. Oh, I apologize. Ms. Jackson cannot vote. 
Thank you. It's a budget item. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> Ms. Jacobs? Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. Colleagues, we have one registered speaker um, on non-agenda items. Uh, Mr. David Elkhan, if you would please come forward. You must speak on the topic for which you have been registered. The board will not address your comments at the sound of the buzzer. Please complete the sentence that you're on. You may not relinquish any part of your testimony to a registered or unregistered speaker. We encourage you to use titles rather than names. Please leave a copy of your statement if you have one in the file next to Mr. Coleman. Mr. Carr. Thank you. Uh, there, I'd like to touch on at least two or three aspects of your bylaw on meeting of meetings of the board and how you handle them. The first is what I'm doing right now, and that's public participation on a non-agenda item. For me, it's no problem. I stay late. I stick it out with you all through the meeting. But for most people, particularly parents of students in the school system, this is not a good time for them to testify before you and bring their concerns to you or praise you or whatever they want to do on non-agenda items. And I would urge you to move them to the beginning of the agenda where they were before. You know, I've heard board members say, well, we have to stay, so why shouldn't they? Well, if your purpose is to impose discipline on parents and other residents, that makes a lot of sense. If your purpose is to include members of the community in your uh, deliberations and hear what they have to say, if it's um, to get their input, then that's not a good thing. It should be at the beginning of the meeting. So that's the first thing. The second thing is the value of requiring two readings before the board takes action. Uh, two readings is, uh, are good for the uh, residents. They're also good for every board member. They give people a chance to see what's proposed and deliberate on it and come back to you with um, ideas for improvement or concerns about it. The same thing each board member gets to see it twice initially and then have a couple of weeks generally before you have to take a final vote. Maybe things can be improved that way. Now there are two exceptions. Uh, three exceptions if you include the legislative agenda. But the two main ones are emergency items, like one we just have. And I dare say some emergency items look like they're not that much of an emergency and they should have been anticipated. But that's a reasonable exemption. The other is the consent agenda, which were supposed to and always through history have only been administrative actions and ministerial actions where there's no discretion. This board has enlarged upon them and taken them out of the two reader process into a single reader and introduced other categories of things, things that just because they came up at a previous board meeting were talked about. But the main change that you've made recently is instead of being a consent agenda, the consent agenda doesn't require consent of everybody anymore. Um, now you're doing it by majority vote which denies each board member who has a concern the right to move this to the, um, let me just finish my sentence, to move this to the two-reader process. And the community and board members are now denied that ability on things that ha are controversial rather than things that are ministerial or administrative. So I, I hope you'll reconsider what you're doing. Thank you. Colleagues, that brings us to uh, follow-up items. Any questions or comments on follow-up items from board meeting? January 5th, 2012. Seeing none, Ms. Higgins, can I have a motion to confirm actions taken in executive session, please? I move that we confirm actions uh, that were taken in executive session. Is there something else I'm supposed to read? Thank you, Ms. Higgins and colleagues. That would have included uh, personnel actions, mm -hmm. legal advice, Thank you. Um, administrative appointments, acting interim appointments, all employees acting interim assignments, 
administrative transfers, employee appeals, student appeals, and legal matters. Thank you, Ms. Higgins. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Waller. It's been properly moved and second that we approve actions taken in executive session. All in favor? Aye. Any objections? Abstentions? Saying none, the motion passed. Colleagues, may I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second that we adjourn this meeting and we are hereby adjourned. Thank you for your attendance. Thank you.